Hello everybody, welcome to PAX Online. My name is Patrick, and like everybody here, I'm a big fan of board games, and as the title suggests, I'm also very much into 3D printing. In fact, the main reason I got into 3D printing is board games. I have bought my first 3D printer a little over two years ago, bought more since then. I've been printing almost all the time ever since. I have way more uptime than downtime, and almost everything I print is related to board games, almost. It's one of the best investments I've made for my hobby. And what I'd like to do today is let you know exactly what having a 3D printer at home entails if you happen to also be into board gaming. I think it's a great thing to get into. Um, we've seen a lot of people that sell all kinds of implements to make your games look better or easier to play. Um, they're often costly, but they're worth it. What I want to show you is how you can unlock that potential at your home for a relatively low cost. So without further ado, let me show you exactly what we're going to be doing today. We're going to be talking about this in three sections. There's going to be uh, what I like to call the spiel. Uh, basically, this is the kind of talk I have with people whenever I want to introduce them to this mix of the two hobbies together. Uh, usually it's what I, I tend to have as a conversation whenever I'm at a con convention and I'm showing up with these parts and everybody's like curious about where I got all this stuff. They're super weird out when I say I made it myself, it wasn't that hard, blah, 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 you know. Uh, second part is uh, how does this all work? Because whenever I start talking about this, it, it always opens up a can of worms. There's going to be questions, they're always the same questions at first. And it's, it's hard not to avoid delving into the technicalities of it. So we're going to do that. And once we have that done, it's going to permit us uh, a deeper view into all the rest. Like, how do we get to do this? Uh, what do we do when we can't find the models that we want to do? All kinds of tips and tricks to make printing for board games easier and more accessible, more fun, and so forth. So basically, it's going to be three parts the spiel, the technical, and like what I like to call the fun stuff. So without further ado, let me start with uh, a little story about how I got into this. And it's actually a great way to segue into everything else you can do. So uh, a while back, well before there was a Kickstarter, it was announced for Terraforming Mars saying they're finally going to be making all these beautiful 3D versions of their tiles. Well, one of my good friends three years ago was really into the game already and he loved the game so much that he went online and bought a whole bunch of things to make his game look better. Uh, so to give you an idea of what we're talking about here, this is what the game looks like. Um, usually stock, no nothing. Uh, you're going to see a bunch of color cubes that represent which players put down which kind of tiles. And these tiles represent forests, these represent cities. They're all generic cities except for maybe this one, which is really ain't that different. Uh, you got ocean tiles. It's it's a fairly simple diagram. It's not a bad game, by the way. It's just simple looking. But this is what his version looked like. And as soon as we played with his version, immediately, you know, we were enthralled with it. Like, we were, we were, we wanted everything that the guy had. Uh, I mean, there were inlays for the boards and the expansions and there were custom ships and there were custom forests and cities and since we're we're geeks here i think it's here only that we'll be able to have a conversation even deeper than just showing you that image notice how there's less cubes on the board that's because he didn't only improve some on onto some of the components he also got rid of some of the mechanics of the components that he didn't like because having the ability to find your own version of components for any game means you can change the way it's played without cheating, without without changing the game itself, but making it play the way you would rather play it. Because there are a lot of games that have components that work differently. They have component mechanics that work differently from one game to another. He just adapted the way other mechanic other games work to terraforming Mars. So um, as soon as we play with that version, we were on our way back home and I immediately told myself, this is it. This is the reason I've been looking for to get a 3D printer. I know I'm going to buy one and it, it's not going to accumulate dust because I got so many games and I love Terraforming Mars and I, I, I want to see what I could do with that with my other games as well. But obviously the first thing I wanted to do was to emulate what he had. So I went back home 
bought a 3D printer, and I started looking for the same parts that he had. And not only did I find them, but I also found that the 3D printing and board games was actually a lot more popular than I thought. To a point, a lot of people had these different versions, these different sets of components that you could put into the game. Uh, and I found one that went ahead and literally detailed every single different city in its uniqueness from the cars themselves. Now, normally you wouldn't see this in the game. Normally, whenever you have a city, you just plop it down and that's it. Uh, but the reality of the game is there are a lot of different cities that come from special cards and you don't really see that on the board. You just know it by looking at your 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 tableau on in front of you that these cities that you own are actually a little bit more special and so forth. Well, it was actually possible for us to print all of those single cities and have a, a different looking version of our 3D terraforming Mars and it looks a lot I, I like my version a lot more. His version has a lot more colors and I'm kind of jealous of that. I'm still very envious of it. Um, and I wish I knew how to color print, how I could actually, uh, you know, print minis if I, uh, not minis, but if I could actually paint minis, I, I'm sure I could do a really good job. But uh, long story short, his version is much more colorful. Ours is much more monochromatic, um, but they both have their advantages and disadvantages. Long story short, there was a lot of stuff that you could do out there. So hence started the big adventure of printing everything else I could think of for my board games. So the first example that we can look into the things that you can do if you have a 3D printer is obviously components. A lot of games have components that can be improved of. And I keep going back to Terraforming Mars only because it's one of the best examples I have to show you I could have picked other games that would have other uh, examples, but this is one I have with the most printed parts. Um, to give you another idea of what kind of upgrades you can make for any game, uh, in the case of Terraforming Mars, these are the these are the basic ships that come with it with one of the expansions. As you can see, they're not very ship-like; they're more like arrows, uh, and you identify these ships by slotting them with color cubes. Uh, again, my friend simply printed ships of a specific color to get rid of those cues. But uh, on day one, day one, I found uh, people that made different looking ships, simply a little bit more, I don't want to say realistic, but it looked a little bit more like an actual ship on the board game. And I ended up printing those. Um, what I'm trying to say is that better components are very easy to find for pretty much any board game. You're going to find... Uh, even upgraded currencies. You're going to find ways to make your own special meeples. You can make 3D versions of any tile that you can pretty much think of. Uh, if you want to find faction ships or miniatures or buildings, it's very easy to find that as well. Uh, if you want to upgrade the look of any game that you already have. Now, that was the main thing I kept doing for the first couple of weeks, if not a couple of months. But... Eventually, I started printing other things. And one of the things I tend to print the most actually nowadays are inserts. Um, this is actually an insert I printed for a game called Arkham Horror. Uh, this is a quick video I made when I present it, when I finished it. As you can see, it's completely modular. It's very easy to deploy and put down whenever I want to play the game. And there are basically inserts for almost anything I can think of. And the, the crazy part is this insert, if I would have brought, bought it off of a third party company was have been easily twenty thirty dollars almost the price of the game that cost me about two dollars worth of material that was like super cheap and I printed it overnight uh, you can make your own custom custom inserts you can make modular containers to sort things like all kinds of tokens and and, and components and cubes and money. Um, I have a ton of them for any game that has money, like Scythe, for example. Uh, this one, this is one I printed for um, for Wingspan. Uh, you can make grids and overlays of all kinds. Uh, again, Terraforming Mars, there's a lot of components, mechanical components in that game where you just put cubes on top of cardboard, which is very easy to fly off, but these, these overlays are simply a must. Um, usually you would pay upwards of $30 online to buy these, in these inserts. 
um, at least at the time. I know there are a lot of ways for you to get actual better cardboard inserts from the company that made Terraforming Mars itself. But um, these cost me 25 cents to make each. And I actually still print them and give them out whenever I can. So uh, you can make dice towers. You can make dice arenas. You can make all kinds of stuff. And speak, speaking of of dice and other games related to dice, obviously you're probably also into games like RPGs. And if is the case, well, 3D printing can also be a good friend here. These are tiles that I printed uh, to create my own dungeon. I have a much bigger one that's a lot better looking, but I wanted to throw something really quickly for this presentation just to show you exactly what you can do. They're, they're basically any kind of dungeon environment if you want to create them to have, uh, and, and obviously you, you'll want to paint them if you want to make them look good like acquisition ink maps or critical role maps and stuff like that. You can absolutely do that. You just print the tile types that you need and want, and you can find them for literally any environment and you'll be able to uh, basically use them you can even print all kinds of accessories like tables and, and furniture and so forth um, and the crazy part is for for map tiles like these there's an actual open source map building system for 3d printers where you can just go down sh you know look around for I don't want to say shop because it's actually free uh, and you just look around, look for for the tiles that you want, and that's it. And these tiles cost me about 25 cents as well to print. It takes a lot of time, but over time, I just build my collection. And you can make dice boxes. You can make your own currencies and coins. There's a lot of ways that you can implement your RPGs with um, all kinds of storytelling props. So, for example, you, you can create idols of power. You can create gameplay elements like scrying bones that if one of your players throws down it can dictate the kind of uh, bonuses or debuffs that your team will have somewhat prediction the future of the next fight you can say oh this is not going to go well you know um i actually uh, i actually uh even went ahead and printed these very quick uh inspiration tokens and i put them down in front of me whenever i dm and people know that if they bring their a game they're going to get some of these to spend. And it's a very simple, I don't want to say psychological, but it's a very simple trick that makes gaming better, makes the session better. And it's such an easy implement too. Long story short, there's so many things that you can do here. And again, if we're talking about RPGs and map and making dungeons, well, you're probably wondering and probably guessing that you can also make terrain for all kinds of wargaming. So uh, if you want to make your own buildings, your, mo your own laser bunkers, your crash ships, your treasure hordes, you can do it. And, you, and if you're into crafting these things by hand, um, you can actually also print tools for that, such as rolling pins, which are used to uh, press down textures on floors and surfaces, such as bricks uh, and and die and die and all kinds of of, uh, of uh, temple floors and so forth. Uh, it's very easy to print, very easy to use. And if we're saying wargaming and RPGs and all these other board games, you're probably asking yourself, can I print minis? And the answer to that is yes, but there's a lot to say about printing minis. We're going to talk about it, but we're not going to, I don't want to get this too out of scope. So Here's the thing. I'm, first, I'm going to pr uh, point you towards this um, article from a website called All3DP, uh, which is called 3D Printer for Miniatures, All You Need to Know. I'll also show you a whole bunch of other um, resources for that a little bit later. But yes, you can print your own miniatures of all shapes and sizes. And if you happen to be into mini painting, there's also tools that you can print. Uh, so, for example, I use um, GW Citadel paint pots, which I'm not a big fan of the actual pot themselves. I love the paints. I hate the pots. So there are actually um, paint pot holders that exist that let you keep those those pots open so you can scoop out the, 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 the paint that you need. There's also, for example, um, uh, you know, paint trays and and you know, paint, you know, brush holders, whatever you can think of, you can, you could literally print your own wet palette if you want. So, um, 
whenever I talk about this, whenever I talk about all this stuff, it always brings up the same questions. And it's the same three, almost always. How much does it cost? Do I have to do 3D modeling? And what's the catch? So let's look at these three questions before we dive into the technical stuff. How much does it cost to get into 3D printing? I'm going to tell you how much it cost me, but um, we're going to revisit that question later because after I'm going to tell you about all the types of different technologies that exist out there, that question is going to be, the answer is going to be a bit different. So I'm going to tell you how much it costs me to do what you saw. So um, an entry level printer like the type I got is between $200 and $300. The first printer I bought was about $220 US. And the material I use is about $20 to $25 USD for about one kilogram or 2.2 pounds of material. Um, a lot of people, whenever I sh show those stats, they go like, oh, I can find it cheaper if you want. But there is such a thing as being too cheap. And if you go, if you, basically the material uh, that you use to print is kind of like paint in, in the sense that uh, there are paints that are so cheap that you hate using them and you'll you'll swear never to use them again. It's kind of the same thing for me. So in a certain in, in most cases, I have brands that I kind of swear to, and they're at least around the 25 USD range. Um, <clears throat> so that brings the cost to about, for a couple examples, a 28 millimeter miniature, which is a typical miniature, is about a dime if you want to print it out. Um, now, the other question, which is, do you need to do any 3D modeling to do 3D printing? And the answer to that is absolutely not. Now, listen to listen to this bit, though, because I want to be very transparent. My first year in 3D printing, which I easily printed the most stuff, all right, um, I never even looked into doing any kind of 3D modeling whatsoever because I did not need to. The, the most of what I do still to this day, even though I know about 3D print and 3D modeling now, I still d almost never touch that stuff. Almost never. I'm saying almost never as in 99%. I just want to be very transparent. What I will say is that knowing about simple editing goes a long way, but you really don't need to do it. Now, let me put it this way. Knowing how to download a recipe from the internet for a, 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 on how to make cookies and making the cookies at home is what we're talking about almost all the time whenever we're doing 3D printing, at least in the context of board gaming, in the context of what I'm going to be showing you today. There's a difference between the person who's the chef who comes up with knowing which kind of ingredients, wet and dry and so forth, and knowing how long you'll need to put that in the oven. That's the job of the modeler who shares their, their, their models online. You just download it and print it. That is your 3D printing enthusiast. That is not up to you to come up with the models. You don't need to do any modeling. If you know how to do modeling, you're probably going to enjoy it even more. But none of that is going to stop you from enjoying everything we're going to be talking about today. Okay? So, no, you don't need to do any 3D modeling to do 3D printing. 3D printing is about getting a 3D model, which can come from any source whatsoever. You take it and you print it. Another example, and the final one I'll give you, you could be a writer that knows how to write books, but maybe you just want to print a couple of the pages from that book you don't need to be a writer, right? So, uh, moving on to the last question, what's the catch? There is a catch. There's definitely a catch. The catch is this is not a hobby that is made or is ready for the mass market. It is really, let's put it this way. These machines get out of tune all the time. They need constant calibration. They need love and attention. When they break down, you're less and less on your own because there are a lot more shops that do 3D printing services nowadays. So they'll probably be able to help you fix them. But in most cases, you're going to be on your own. When you're going to buy them, they're going to come completely disassembled. And I don't mean, oh, I need to uh, 
put this part here and there and snap and that there we go no i'm talking about the belts are off everything is to be done it could take you hours to to set it up for the first time in my case my first printer it almost took me a day uh, and if you're not technical it's going to be a little bit longer but it doesn't mean it's out of your out of the scope of you being able to do this I want to be, again, very transparent here. I've been in IT for more than 25 years. Look at this gray. This is all IT gray, all right? Um, I've been troubleshooting stuff every single day for most of my career life. And I thought this would be a joke, but because it was mechanically inclined, which I never really did before, I never really did mechanical IT troubleshooting and mechanical troubleshooting, it kind of took me by surprise. I eventually had to learn it, but I had to learn a new skill by doing so. Because in, in the case of 3D printing, especially one of the two technologies, if a screw is too tight or a belt is too loose, it shows up in your prints. So uh, it, you really need to be careful with your machines. This is not to scare people off, it's to give a very clear warning that this is not a hobby that you can pick up like this, you're gonna to have to invest some of your time to get into it. But once you do, once you get over the learning bump, it gets a lot smoother. And thankfully, it's totally doable to get into this hobby because there's it's it's not as niche as it used to be. There are a lot a lot of online resources to help you out. You just need to know what que which questions to ask and kind of you will need to do a lot of reading up or watching videos. Uh, in that sense, um, your options are basically all the kinds of online help and tutorials of forums. All that stuff is going to be a huge help. Even better, even, however, COVID is not really helping. Uh, local maker spaces are a huge help as well because in many cases, at least one person is going to be a 3D printer enthusiast and they'll be able to help you out with some questions you may have. Uh, local libraries, by the way, also have more and more uh, 3D printers, which you can rent by the hour or by the print. So, if you don't want to, if you want to like do a soft dive, you can always go over there and use the theirs. That could all be uh, always something you can do. And if all of the above is just too much, still not your bag. Well, you can still keep listening because a lot of the things I'm going to be talking to about today. They're going to be relevant regardless. You can still look around for models and parts that you will want to use. And you can ask a designer or someone who does 3D printing to help you out and print those parts. You'll just have the files on hand and ask them to do it. And in, in fact, in many cases, the designers of these, these parts usually have a link where you can order the parts from them. They'll just print it out for you. Um, so hopefully I didn't scare off too many people, but again, let's be clear, let's be transparent. It's not always super easy to get into 3D printing, but I swear to you, once you're in it, it's it goes a lot smooth, a lot smoother than the first few weeks. Um, which brings us to the technical part. Now, I've um, the technical part here is going to be sh literally tailored to people who are board gamers i'm not here to explain to you about every single thing that exists when it comes to 3d printing and the technical aspects i only want to talk about the parts that are going to be mostly interesting for board gamers i want to talk about the aspects that will be of major interest let's put it that way so it's a very high level view of all of that there's a lot of stuff we're going to be not talking about and that's normal all right um so uh, without further ado, let's start off and look into what actually 3D printing is. Because the reality, and I'm stealing that from a 3D uh, from a, a TED talk about one of the designers of one of the two technologies I'm going to be talking about, there is no such thing as 3D printing. It doesn't exist. You don't 3D print something. What you're actually doing is you're printing something in 2D over and over and over again, one cross section at a time. 3D printing basically involves printing slices of objects and stacking them up until you end up with something. 
A crazier example would be that the Michelin Man is technically a just stacks of tires. Well, we're making stacks of 2D prints made out of plastic, which is just thick enough to have some build-up material going on over and over again. Um, so when you think about it, um, there's a lot of ways that you can end up doing slices of an object, especially nowadays when if you, I mean, look, I can microwave a hot dog in 30 seconds in my microwave, right? So probably not enough, but still. Um, so there are a lot of different technologies that you can use to actually come up with slices of objects. There's uh, right now there, probably one of the next big things that's going to come out is uh, sound based 3D printing. A lot of people are working on that. It apparently is very promising. But for you and me, for Monsieur, Madame, tout le monde, you're going to have. There are basically two technologies that are readily available for consumer 3D printing. Right. The first one is called FDM printing. It's it means fused deposited material. It's easily one of the most popular, uh, more common printers that you'll find in houses right now. This is the one where you have a spool of plastic. Uh, and when I mean spool, you basically have like a strand of plastic that's being fed through a hot nozzle, which is itself moving around, drawing on a plate. And when it's done with the first section, it moves up just a little bit on top and starts drawing again on top of the last layer. Um, if I were to give you an example, think of a hot glue gun. If you wanted to make a log cabin with a hot glue gun, you know, that would be it. Except, obviously, the 3D printing process is a lot more precise and the hot glue gun was a bit messy. Um, the second met method, uh, which is commonly known as resin, is actually known under the term stereolithography apparatus. Now, I don't like to name that too often, and I can't believe I got it on the first try, so anyway. Um, so yeah, stereolithography apparatus, twice, uh, better known as SLA or resin printing, it basically looks like sorcery. Uh, this one uh, involves having a, a pool of liquid resin, which is kind of is actually a special liquid uh, that is sensitive to light. And when it's hit with the right right wavelengths of light, it um, or light waves or whatever. I'm not into physics, but um, long story short, when it's hit with the right type of light, that part will harden. And so um, they basically shoot the surface of the resin, uh, the pool of resin, and remove that uh, with, with light, draw the shape that they want, remove that layer and do it again and again and again. And it's actually a little bit faster to print uh, than, than um, FDM. Uh, and it makes fantastic results, but it's very messy. It looks super weird. It kind of looks like... Uh, the T1000 when it comes out because it, when it, when it comes out of uh, from its liquid form into something because it's almost it's almost that it's I, I call it voodoo sorcery whenever I see it normally I would have shown you videos of how that works but unfortunately uh, oh there's a little bit I forgot to mention here but uh, normally I would have shown you videos of that but since we're on Twitch and PAX online and everything I don't want to get into uh, potential fights with YouTubers and just steal their videos out. However, I, I strongly suggest you go and check out time lapses of those those types of printers. I have a quick link to show you where you can go. Um, but uh, before I go on, uh, when it comes to resin printing, there's going to be a lot of purists out there going to say, you got DLP, you got SLA, it shouldn't be resin. Look, the thing is, when it comes to resin printing, there are actually two types of resin printers right now. There is one called the SLA, the other one is called DLP. But um, the difference between the two printers is that one shoots a laser drawing the image and the other projects an image of the entire layer at one at a time. It gives, there are plus and minuses to both technologies, um, but they're essentially the same. Right? In the sense that it's the same kind of material, the same process, it's the same technology, it's the same, it's the same material when you're printing with it. So a lot of people kind of just use a shorthand resin, not because of that, but because it's, it's also kind of more popularly known as resin printing. So I'm going to use the term resin printing as of now. So 
Uh, just know that it's a little bit more complicated than just saying resin printing, but in the end, it is it is uh, resin based, right? Um, this is this is a quick idea of what these printers look like. When you see a printer that looks like this. It's because it's an FDM printer. These are the printers that basically have these nozzles that are being fed plastic through this tube, which normally there would be a spool around here, but you can't really see it. Uh, it's not there right now. And it's kind of a big spool. It would take maybe about this big in size, maybe a quarter of, of the image easily. Uh, and that whole frame would move in the X, Y, and Z planes, drawing in, uh, drawing with that plastic, where instead, when you have a resin printer, it's more of a, of a container of resin, which is protected with usually a special see-through shell, so normal wavelengths of light wouldn't affect the resin. And this plate here would dip down and rise up with the object itself creating it out of liquid as it's being pulled out. Um, I strongly, normally in my presentations, whenever I give them, I've given them to Gen Con, to Virtual Con, I've given them to uh, Dice Tower, all these other places where I gave those, those presentations, I would have these time lapses. Uh, unfortunately, I can't show them here for reasons. Uh, but it's very easy for you to go on YouTube and just look up FDM time lapse or resin printer time lapse, and you're going to find dozens and dozens of examples of what the printing process looks like. Um, I actually have one example to show you. That's one of the old first videos I've made a long time ago when I was doing a print for some of the components I've shown you in the, in the pictures. Uh, and as you can see, it takes a lot of time whenever you're printing something because it, it doesn't move super fast. And once you're done with one layer, it's going to move up by my, literally tenths of millimeters and do that layer again and again. So most prints take a lot of time. I don't, I think for that print, I was already two hours in just to make those four very small ships. So yes, there are prints that can last literally days before they're done. So I'm just going to move on to the next um, to the next slide here. Um, now here's where things are going to get interesting for people who are into board games. Let's look at the precision and the differences between the two prints. This is a miniature that I printed a while back. It's 47 millimeters high. It's actually almost twice as high as a normal typical miniature. So it's kind of big, right? And um, this was for a Cthulhu themed token that I needed. And you're looking at it literally with the equivalent of a magnifying glass. This, if I were to show you this normal size, you would barely be able to see all the little details of, of filament that you can actually see if you take a look here you can you can tell this was basically stacks of filament put on top of each other uh, you can even see it sometimes kind of screwing up and not being properly laid down but from an arsling's distance you cannot tell any of these these issues these artifacts however same size same distance of looking at it this is what a resin printer looks like and as you can see, it is by far superior in terms of results. This image is um, is provided to us by uh, Harrow, uh, their Harrowtail Studio. Sorry, I, I almost forgot, who graciously provided the image for this slide. Um, this is one of his prints, and as you can see, it's so good you can literally see the pores of in the skin. You can see uh, details in the rivets. There is literally no layer of visible. Now, I can tell you that if I wanted to, I could have pushed the quality and the resolution of my print on the left a lot more if I wanted to, but it would still not be as good or even close to this ever, especially if you're looking at it with a magnifying glass. Resin will always be better in terms of, of looks. A lot of people will boast that their printers can make resin quality. 
And I agree that a lot of printers can definitely surprise you in the terms of quality of print that they can make. This is actually not bad in terms for an FDM. You could still push it more, but it's it's going to be a lot of work and a lot of calibration and so forth. And in the end, if you had the choice between the two tools, even if you knew your FDM printer could make a good job, you there's a good chance you would still rather use just your resin printer, right? So that being said, you're probably asking yourself, why would I ever not use a resin printer? Why should I buy an FDM printer instead of resin? And this is where the conversation starts about resin versus FDM. And we're going to do that by starting with the costs. I told you to revisit, we would revisit this slide. Now's the time. So how much does 3D printing cost? FDM printers are between $200 and $300 for an entry range. And by the way, when I mean entry range, let me be clear here. If you need a hammer because you need to nail down a couple of nails from time to time, and you go to the hardware store, are you gonna buy the $10 hammer that will do the job just, just good enough? Or are you gonna buy the super deluxe WeWalt that comes in black and yellow and has a laser guide next to the hammerhead and has a you know, microbial sponge handle and blah, blah, blah. No. Bells and whistles are great for people that use that tool all the freaking time as a livelihood, which is not our case. These printers are good enough. They don't have all the bells and whistles. They will do the job great. If you're at a point where you're just frustrated because you wish you had XYZ, you can probably upgrade them, but you won't still need the two ten three thousand dollar printer ten thousand dollar printer because yes they can go as high as that but there are a lot of different types of technologies and printers and industrial uses that you are not in the need to do so fdm printers entry range consumer base almost always good enough 200 to 300 dollars is pretty much the range when it comes to resin printers, it usually starts more around $250 and upwards of $300, but it's definitely within the range of the same prices that we used to pay for FDM printers. Now, the great, fantastic news, in fact, is that these used to be in the thousands, easily $2,000 for the old form factor when it came out, which was a consumer level one, which is not really the big price difference between a gaming PC when you think about it, and it has its advantages. But uh, long story short, it's going to be slightly more expensive than a normal printer. Where things start to differ a bit, um, it's when we're going to start looking at the price and the cost of materials. So FDM filament is cheap. It's readily available. You can find it almost anywhere. I started seeing some in big retail chains that I would have normally went to to buy movies and music. I'm not going to name names. Kind of surprised that it started going there, but we're at that point. But when it comes to resin, um, it gets a little bit more expensive because it's a specialized material. Um, so it costs about $40 USD per liter, which is about 160 or so dollars a gallon. I made the math. It came down to that. Um, the thing is that I don't have empirical evidence to tell you that prints are actually going to be higher cost. I know they're going to be higher cost, but by which margin, I cannot tell you. I can tell you that some people say that a 28 millimeter mini that used to cost you a dime is going to be in the dollar range, if not a couple of dollars. I don't have the proof for that. Mathematically, I'm not sure that's true either. But there's a lot of ways that you can print minis, and there's probably ways you can print them cheaper as well. So that's something to consider. Um, but for sure, your prints are going to be more expensive. That is a given. Now, that's probably not a big enough issue to say that we should completely dump FDM uh, that we should just, I mean, sorry, it's probably not a big enough issue to say that you're going to stay away from resin because of the, these cost differences. They're, they seem to be okay, right? Um, but there's a little bit more to it. And this is where things get really different. The major difference is, um, in terms of, of, of workflow, there are basically 
three steps that are the same. You're going to start off with, no, let me let me rephrase that. When you use an FDM printer or an SLA or resin or a DLP printer, whatever, uh, the first three steps are the same. You're going to start looking around for the 3D files that you want to print. Once you have that, you're going to process them to get them ready for print. That step is called slicing. We're going to revisit that at, as the last slide of this presentation. No worries, but it's definitely a big world that we need to look into. So the second thing is that you do, you look at your model, you get it ready for print by slicing it, and then you send it to the printer. With an FDM printer, with a fused deposited material printer, once the print is done, you pick it off of the plate within minutes. In fact, if you have a blade scraper, you can probably just scrape it off the build plate within the second it's done, but I'd rather let it cool off for two or three minutes. I'm a patient person and I can start using it. No problem, no gloves needed, no nothing. With resin, you're only halfway done because once your print is done, uh, you need to do a chemical wash. Uh, because now your your model is wet with the material that is it, itself hardened because of light. So you want to get that stuff off as quickly as possible before it hardens for reasons, right? So once you're done with that, um, and by the way, you need, I think it's um, some kind of rubbing alcohol. I'm not exactly sure. I, I don't have a resin printer, so I can't tell you. Um, but uh, I, I'm pretty sure I know which material, uh, which alcohol it is. Once you're you're done with that wash, you want to recuperate your material that you didn't use, because unlike filament, which just stops feeding, in this case, you don't want to let it sit and risk it getting exposed to anything. So you're going to recuperate it. But during the printing process, there's a chance that there are shards or particulates that were uh, that were formed during the printing process or maybe it's dust and particles, whatever. You want to filter that out and recuperate the material for safekeeping. And after that, you need to take your print and you need to put it in the sun or a UV light source, like nail salon lamps, for example, and you let it there for a couple of hours because it needs to cure in the sun. And by the way, the entire process is a gloves on, mask on process for uh, resin. Speaking of which, safety. Uh, FDM printers uh, can use a lot of different types of plastic. There are a lot of different types of spools of plastic that you can buy and use when you're printing. One of these types of plastics called ABS can emit toxic fumes while you're printing. Meaning if you want to print with that stuff, you need to have a well-ventilated area if you want to do it. But for board game purposes, I never had to use anything else than another type of plastic called PLA. We're going to talk about that later. ABS is done, is used for rugged outdoor prints or projects that you want to beat the crap out of or to let out in the sun for a long time. But we don't use that not in board gaming printing. We just use PLA. PLA is food safe. It doesn't emit any odor. It's not toxic, blah, blah. It's actually mostly made out of food. It's actually made out mostly of cornstarch. So there's no safety considerations in terms of, uh, other than using an electrical equipment that you obviously, there's always the risks there, but uh, like your toaster, but, um, uh, there's no there's no toxicity or issues. You don't need gloves or anything. You just print it. Once you're done, you take it off and that's it. However, when it comes to um, resin printing, it's a mask on, gloves on process the entire time. First off, just the printing itself is very uh, emits a very strong odor, and it has it, it permeates easily. So if you have like you know, textile cushions in the, in the next room that could actually permeate to that. Uh, you'll easily get a headache uh, if you're not filtering yourself, uh, fil filtering the air as you're printing. Um, in fact, most of the resin printers, the modern ones, they actually come with uh, air, air ventil uh, 
ventilator duct adapters in the back already there, ready to be installed so that you can ventilate that, that air elsewhere. Um, and once you're done, well, because of the wash chemical process and everything else, you, you need to keep your gloves on, masks on, and, and so forth. So it's um, the great result that you get out of them comes at the cost of you of being a little bit more careful. It's a more demanding technique, but it's totally worth it, especially if you're in miniature. So that is something you want to take into consideration. Um, just being able to print something without having to worry about gases or, or toxicity or anything is, for me, the main deciding factor as to why I don't use one in the house that I have right now. I will be getting one. There's no way I'm not getting a resin printer eventually. I'm just waiting for the right opportunity, place, time, and setup for me to get one. So um, in terms of board gamers, uh, let's look at these two next slides, which will help you understand exactly what tool is best for what. Uh, the main differences that we have when it comes to uh, to the two printers, the two technologies, well, it's very easy to determine that resin is by far the best looking type of print that you can get. We're talking movie prop quality prints, right? If you want to, if you want to completely replicate something and someone would not be able to tell where the hell that thing came from, you'd go with a resin printer easily. Uh, but everything else, when it comes to expense of prints or the var variety of materials, like I said, PLA and, and, and I mean, uh, FDM has a lot of different types of materials and they also come in a lot of different colors and plastics. Again, I'll show you that a little bit later. Um, that goes to FDM and that opens up a lot of creative possibilities as you can be able to see a bit later. And another thing I didn't mention uh, is that the build plates for these two machines tend to vary greatly. FDM machines, the spool ones, they tend to have a bigger build plate, easily two to three times bigger for the same price than a resin printer, which is usually the size of, not unlike that of a cell phone. Um, so th there is no job that's too big for a printer. If something goes beyond the size of the machine itself, the, the, the build plate itself, you can just break that part down into different pieces and print it separately and glue everything together after that. Um, but obviously it's a lot more easy if you don't have to do that all the time, especially if your projects involve printing big things. If you want to print big things, they're actually big printer, big FDM printers are a lot cheaper to get than re big resin printers. You can get big resin printers, but they're, they're, they don't they don't come cheap, right? So um, here, what I'd like to do is give you an idea of what tool I would rather use for any given job when it comes to uh, board gaming. Basically, all the stuff that we talked about a little, a little bit earlier before at the beginning of the presentation would go a little bit like this, right? Um, when it's a, a clear grave, to me, it means it's a clear winner. Uh, when it's dark gray, it means I would rather use that tool if I could. But any of these tools, they would still be, any one of these two printers can do everything I'm listing down here, all right? No printer is limited in terms of what it can do. It's just a question of what tool would you rather use to do X, Y, Z. So when it comes to miniatures, it's no contest miniatures are by far best done on an FD, on a resin printer but you can still do them on that FDM printer look i have some some minis right here like this is the cthulhu thing i was talking to you about not that big can you tell the problem with it i can't you know uh i have my terraforming mars first player token here i printed a uh a complete reproduction of the Curiosity Rover. Can you see the problems with it? I can't. No problem. There's, you can make so many things with those printers, they're crazy. But if I had a resin printer, you would freak out because it would be that good, right? When it comes to board game components, they'd be better looking on, an F, on a resin printer, but 
you tend to have to make a lot of them. And because of the entire workflow process, sorry, for a resin printer is a little bit more complex. They're good enough on an FDM printer, but I would rather use them uh, on an FDM printer because it's it's easy for me to print a lot of different parts all at the same time, which is not a super good idea. But uh, because if one part screws up, it could screw up everything else at the same time. But it's still for me, my, my, my choice uh, if I had to make a lot of different parts. Uh, when it comes to board game inserts or custom containers or dice trays, dice towers, things that are re relatively big, I'd rather do it on the on the uh, FDM printer. I can do it with a resin printer, but I'm limited by size and I have to break them down all the time. Uh, and honestly, I don't really care about the look of the panels if they're resin-like. It doesn't really matter. I don't look at that. So for me, it's good. It's more than good enough. It does a great job. When it comes to props, good enough on an FDM printer, but if you have a resin printer, you give your, your RPG players, for example, class emblems, they're gonna look crazy good. And they're gonna be looking at that from up close. They're gonna have a lot of fun with that. So obviously I would rather do it with a resin printer. And when it comes to resin printing, same thing. Now this is easily one of the, to each his own, but if you wanna make build, build big buildings, probably easier with an FDM printer. But if you wanna make like small parts that are very mini level quality, you're gonna go with a resin printer by far. Which brings us to the very obvious conclusion that when it comes to, um, when it comes to uh, which, pr which printer is better for you, I, my personal opinion is this. I think that when it comes to board games in general, you're better off with an FDM printer. But when it comes to people who are mini painters, for example, people who are really into miniatures and the level of quality of miniatures is very important, you go with resin, right? Um, I've noticed a lot of uh, miniature painters starting to get into the whole resin printing game because a lot of uh, companies uh, actually are now making Kickstarter campaigns to have custom minis uh, created, modeled, and sold in, in campaigns specifically for people who are into resin printing because it's obviously a whole new world for these guys. It's a fantastic thing. But to talk about miniatures and resin gets is something that really gets things out of scope uh, and uh, of this presentation. So what I'm going to do here, I'm going to I'm going to basically point you guys to a couple of of great resources you can look into because these guys are really into not only really great MIDI painting and, and crafting, uh, but they're also, uh, they've also shown a lot of interest in miniature printing lately. So Miniac and Blackmagic Craft are probably my two favorite sources right now, but you also have 3D printed tabletop and spiky bits that mention those a lot. In fact, 3D printed tabletop has a lot to show when it comes to board gaming, tabletop, and all these kinds of things as well. Um, if you want to have more minis than you can throw for your mini printer, like we're talking high level quality, cast quality, you want to go to myminifactory.com. A lot of your models are free. A lot of them are not. They're probably 50-50 at this point. Um, they have a lot of stuff for the miniature enthusiast who likes to print their own things. We're going to talk about that a little bit later because they also have board game stuff. But when it comes to printing minis on resin, can't can't you would it's, it would hard to be worse than to than going somewhere else. So I probably didn't say that right. Blame that on my English not being the first language. Um, but I'm pretty sure you understand what I mean. So uh, that being said. I'm going to concentrate on FDM as of now for the rest of the presentation, mainly because I'm not saying resin has no place in board gaming printing. I, I keep saying you can make anything with either one. It's just more practical. And because of that, more people are most likely going to veer towards FDM printers for cost, ease of use, um, no toxicity issue and so forth and so on, but especially because the materials are 
easily available and easily usable and have a lot of variety. Um, it's probably one of the better solutions. Again, that is my personal opinion. So that, that's where I'm going to veer off uh, for the rest of the presentation. I have no beef against resin. Like I said, I'm getting one. I cannot be more transparent than, than what I just said. So <clears throat> going back to uh, the world of FDM printers, uh, like I said, uh, FDM printers use something called uh, plastics that, are, that come in spools. And they have a lot of different types of materials, ABS, PLA, PEG, so forth. The one that you want to hear about, the one that you want to buy is called PLA. PLA is non-toxic. It is food safe. It is mostly made of cornstarch. And most importantly, it is very reliable when you, when you print with it. it. It doesn't tend to have a lot of failure rate. Because some more exotic materials, I'm saying exotic probably a little bit too exaggeratedly here, but a lot of the materials uh, that exist beyond PLA can be a bit more finicky. Uh, they can be more, they have humidity problems, all kinds of things that you need to take into consideration. Uh, but PLA very rarely fails. So uh, it's a great material to use. It's a lot less frustrating to use it. And like I said, it comes in a lot of different looks and materials. These are just examples. So to give you an idea of how the different types of, of looks and materials you can get out of them, um, I'm going to give you a quick list of what I know by heart, right? So you have your pretty much any color you can think of is going to be there. So you're not just going to find blue. You're going to find sky blue, lake blue, powder blue, dark blue, whatever. You can find any color shade that you probably need for your projects. But if that's not enough, you can even get all of the colors. You can have what they call rainbow colored PLA, which is a, 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 a filament that is gradually constantly changing color. And there are a lot of different types of rainbow colored PLA. I mean, some are specific to certain shades of color. Others are very dynamic. You name it, you can think of it. Um, there is even marbled PLA. So if you want to make statue looking types of prints, you can do that. I'm actually working on creating a bust of uh, popular figureheads so I could put my VR headset on it because, you know, why not? I can do that. Um, you have transparent PLAs. Now, this I think is actually more realistic on a resin printer because um, the, the transparent colors that I've used myself uh, didn't give me clear looking results like that. Um, probably this is being post treated, but I just want people to understand that there's also transparent PLA, which I use for water tiles. I have a bunch of transparent blue PLA ready for that. You have metallic looking PLA. So if you want to print coins and stuff like that, you can use that. You have copper, brass, gold, silver, you name it, it's out there. Uh, and it's really shiny. And by the way, of course I bought some silver looking PLA because I printed myself a, a, a ingot of Beskar, you know, why not? Uh, you got glow-in-the-dark PLA. If you're old like me and you remember G.I. Joe's Zartan figurine that turned green out when he was in the sun, you can print with that stuff as well. You have thermal sensitive, will change color depending on the temperature. You have nylon and silk based PLA, which has a very different smooth looking uh, finish to it. You have carbon fiber. Um, the creases I've seen is wood based. Now this picture is uh, also shared to us from another user. Um, you can sand and stain it, which is what this person did here. Um, this is this one here. I printed myself. It's a failed print. You can see it here. I didn't finish the entire bowl, but I kept it because it was so practical. And to be honest, it looks like wood. It doesn't feel like it at all. Um, in fact, I would tell, I would say that it's more like if plastic and cardboard had a baby, this is what it, you get. It's kind of weird, but very solid, very solid too, which is kind of a happy yet strange effect. Um, you can expect the prices of these colors to and, and types of material uh, of types of PLA to be more expensive the more exotic they get. 
Um, single colors are the, the ones that I said were around the 25 USD range. Multicolor probably is at another five dollars. Um, when I bought gold, I think it cost me about thirty-two dollars or something like that. Uh, and the last thing I want to mention on 3D printing technology is something called slicing. Um, again, you, you could have a full presentation only on, on slicing because there is a lot to talk about it. Um, because it is the entire software side of the 3D printing process. I will give you only the rundown really quickly of what you probably want to know. So slicing software is what makes it possible for you to make any 3D printed file a reality. It's the, it's the thing that makes it possible for you to take any file you find to, and bring it to life with a 3D printer. Uh, it basically takes the model and analyzes it and will be able to tell you what your machine will need to do well, not tell you, but basically create a file giving machine instructions to your printer to know what it needs to do uh, and how it will do it, how it will behave, how it will basically function. So you need to give it at least a couple of settings, such as layer thickness, how much infill you want, like you want your model to be fill or filled or empty or somewhere in between. Um, you can determine the thickness of the exterior of, of the walls and the shells, the top, the bottom parts. If you'll need supports, supports is when you need to print something and there's something that's obviously going to be hanging out in the air, like the letter T standing upright. If you're printing slices at some point, what happens when you add the letter T here? What where does this come from? Well, the supports are basically things that you print in advance, knowing that at some point there's going to be something with an overhang. To give you an idea of what we're talking about here, uh, I have a quick example about layer thickness. Layer thickness is probably the most important, and if not the feature you're going to be changing, or at least taking into consideration for any print. Layer thickness can be easily attributed to the resolution of your print. All right. So in other words, uh, the thinner your layers, the more slices you'll have, and the better looking your print will look like. But the more slices you add, the more time your print will take. So uh, here's a quick example. Here's a model of a snake man, which you can barely tell right now. Uh, but this is what my software, my slicing software was giving me as a preview. If I use the thickest slice I could come up with for my machine, I don't know if I could go thicker than that. But if I, double the number of layers by, by sorry, if I cut down by half the thickness of my layer, it's already looking a lot better, but I've already doubled the time because I have twice as many layers. And if I go even further than that, it looks even better, but now the time is getting really crazy high, but that's fine because it's probably worth it. Look at how clean those edges are now compared to before. I'm going to revert back in my presentation here. Look at how you had steps everywhere and now it's way better looking, right? So these are some of the settings you'll tell your printer before you, you know, this is how you tell your printer, print something like this, okay? <clears throat> now, the good news is that most, if not some of the best slicing softwares that you'll need to print with, they're free. I, uh, Ultimaker Cura is by far one of the most used ones. It's free. And because it's free, it means it's very easy for you to find some help for it because a lot of people will have troubleshooting tips for you and so forth. But there are others like Slicer, literally called Slicer, except the, the last E is a, the number three. Um, there, are, there are Slicers that, are, uh, that you need to pay for, which are considered professional grade, such as... Um, uh, Simplify 3D, which I own, but I still use Cura very often because Cura happens to be, I find it very user-friendly compared to others. And by the way, if all this stuff seems complicated, the good news is that they almost all have some kind of wizard mode where you just say, literally those four settings, it will it ask you, how quickly do you want this or how pretty do you want this and go. But if you want, you can go and 
every single micro detail of how your printer will behave for any given thing. And that would be completely out of the scope of this presentation. What is interesting to you, however, the board gamer, and especially the miniature printer, um, almost every, I actually can't think of a single slicer software that doesn't do this, but because there are a lot of different settings that are possible for any given project, they usually let you save those settings for said project. So for example, if I'm printing a whole bunch of terraforming Mars tiles and I have this specific settings because I have this specific requirement, I have my terraforming Mars settings, right? That I'll save under that word, that name. Now you can share those settings with other people. These settings are easily exportable and importable. And that is a big thing when it comes to miniatures. A lot of people for any given printer, they'll say, I'm using this printer with Cura and I got the best results with these settings and they share it online. And that happens all the time, all the time. So one of the things you want to look out eventually are, you know, when you get a little bit more at ease with the whole process is what settings are other people using and download them and try them out for yourself especially for miniatures and terrain printing. So that being said, that pretty much covers the part that we had as far as technicalities is concerned. What I'd like to do now is go a little bit beyond and start talking about the fun stuff. Now you're, you're completely armed with the basic knowledges of how 3D printing works, what you can do with it. So let's start talking about everything else. Let's start talking about the fun part. All right. So how do we get things done? First off, so sorry for the interruption. Uh, where do we find models to print? Well, that's fairly easy. Uh, we're actually all you all you pretty much need to do is go online on Google and say, I want this 3D part for this thing, right? Uh, 3D name the, the board game that you want, add 3D print, and you're likely going to find something. Now, why are we having a full section around such a simple instruction? Because like everything else in life, we can make things really complicated if we want. Uh, so first off, usually models are free. They're free, they're free to use, they're free to download. They're not free to print and sell, right? Uh, unless you design them yourself, most of the time all these models are free to use, completely legal, no problem. Uh, in fact, some of the sites I'm going to show you, they're 100% free the entire time. Um, however, others are not free and very often, more often than not, actually, you're going to find a lot of Kickstarters specifically for miniatures, specifically. Uh, they're going to be selling huge collections or promise collections for certain types and sets of miniatures going to be made available with very high quality grade specifically for uh, resin printing often. But most of the time, they're free, right? And don't worry, you can't download something accidentally and having to pay for it. I mean, I don't know how you, you no, it's not gonna happen. So what you do, you do is you go on those websites, you look, if there's a price, just be careful. Um, and basically, to be honest, it's always gonna come down to these four websites. Um, Thingiverse is, and used to be at least until recently, the mother of all websites when it comes to downloading parts for, uh, for anything that is related to 3D printing. They're, they're actually the same guys behind the, the Cura software, the same guys behind MakerBot. Uh, they're probably there because they were one of the early adopters of 3D printing and early manufacturers of 3D printing material. Um, a lot of people go there. Unfortunately, their, their search engine is kind of, eh, they've changed the interface, eh, and then the server started to suck. Eh, so anyway, um, we still go there out of habit to search for things just for the heck of it. I still do it every day. But I end up often also going to my mini factory, which is mostly mini based. It was really made for people who were into minis, but they they have a lot of board game stuff too, which is, um, you know, more often than not lately, that's where I find the interesting stuff. Now, 
the reality is I should change my ways and just go to this third site I've mentioned here called Yegi because Yegi is a search engine for 3D models. It's an aggregator. And it always points me towards Thingiverse, my mini, you, shape, you, you imagine in shape ways. I still don't like it too much for whatever reason. It's like I still haven't found full confidence with it. Uh, until recently, things are getting slightly better because they changed their interface. But before, it felt a bit gimmicky and hacky. But uh, things have been looking really good since they've made some changes over there. So definitely something you want to keep in mind. A lot of people from Board Game Geek also point towards you imagine and Shapeways. Um, I don't go there that much because it's very rare that I don't find what I need within Thingiverse and my mini factory in the first place. Um, however, as board gamers, I'd also like to point you towards a very interesting thread called 3D Prints for Board Games. It's a curated thread where board gamers took the time to print actual um prints for any board game that they found that were worthy. In other words, it's kind of like a filter, a filtered version of all the cool stuff that it is to, there, there is to print for board games. Uh, so it's a great place to go and look around in case, you, uh, it, call it the inverse searching. You don't know if there's something you want to print. You go there and you get some ideas of what games you didn't think about printing stuff for, right? Now, uh, here's a couple of examples of searches on Thingiverse, just to give you an idea of how much stuff there is. For Gloomhaven, I, I did this about two months ago, I think. This is the last time I took that screenshot. And this is one of four pages of searches, and you don't even have the full page there. And as you can see, literally anything can be printed in 3D. And if that's just for the tiles, there's also even the insert, which I did print. Um, and... And, and there are player aids and so forth. There are so many things that you can do uh, and, and find just by looking for a board game on one of those websites for, for 3D models, and you're gonna find stuff. You're gonna find stuff for mo pretty much for sure. Um, and in certain cases, you're gonna also find uh, other things that are a bit more, I don't wanna say exotic, but they're more left field, like, things like OpenForge, which is something that was developed by Devon Jones. Uh, he basically created a open source system for people to create tiles for Dungeons & Dragons, Pathfinder, and everything, and make it compatible with anything else that other people would have added to that collection, creating an immense breadth of possibilities. And uh, by the way, it says 2.0. If you have 1.0 parts, they're still compatible. They just don't have these, uh, these clips at the bottom to keep parts together. Uh, but in the end, they're, they're all perfectly fine. And these versions, as you can see, are painted, which looks way better than what I printed for you guys. Um, but the same principle applies. Uh, you even have parts that have uh, holes for LEDs that you can implement if you want to have uh, actual lighting involved. Any kind of terrain you can think of is going to be available. From dungeons, caverns, taverns, swamps, castles, whatever. It's all there. It's all possible. So um, if you are into RPG and you want to build those maps, just go around and look for OpenForge 2.0 and you're going to be attacked by way too much choices. Um, oh, by the way, it's not just about terrain there. I forgot to mention, there's a lot of accessories and miniatures that you can also use to make those terrains a little bit more lively, like barrels and crates and, and so forth. Now, here's what you can do when you can't find something that you are trying to look for. Okay. Because that will happen. That will eventually happen. So the first thing you need to keep in mind is that um, this stuff is named by the makers themselves. It's not like there's like a corporation or an organization out there that is helping everybody keep things in check and to make sure that we have a standard way of naming things. So it will happen often that you will find items that are named differently than what you would have expected, mainly because, especially in the board game industry, a lot of things are kind of recycled and they're reused. They're reskinned, for example. A great example is the Arkham Horror insert I showed you before. 
it was not named Arkham Horror Insert for when I found it. When I found it, it was actually called the FFG LCG Core Set Insert, which sounds... What? But the reality is, if you happen to know how Fantasy Flight Games deals and sells their living card games, um, they tend to have the same box with somewhat the same amount of tokens, token size, same amount of cards, and the same box sizes for Net and the new Android Netrunner Core, The Legend of the Five Rings, I believe Middle Earth as well, and in this case, Arkham Horror. So one insert fits all, works for all of them. So in their mind, the person who built that model, which is a great model, said, I'm going to name it everything, but I only found it by chance because of that. Because again, remember, the Thingiverse website search engine is not the best. So I ended up finding it through Google that I had to go back to Thingiverse to get, to get it. So long story short, be careful of how the way things are named. And sometimes if you happen to know that it could be named differently because it, it could be named after another game, look for that. You could be surprised. You probably will find things. But the other thing, the other way that you can um, fix your search solution is that you can look for the things that you will need instead specifically without caring if someone made it for the game. In other words, if you can't find something for the board game that you're looking for, it doesn't mean you can't get your way anyway. So the first thing you need to consider first is that your slicing software, one of the many basic settings that you can tell it is to change the size of your print. You can change the scale of your print. You can tell it, by the way, whatever I'm printing, I want this many layers, I want overhangs, I want infill, and I want you to print it at 207% or 500%. Or I don't care about the percentage, I'll tell you exactly how wide or how tall I want it. And you can tell that very easily in your slicing software. And it's something that we don't tend to play a lot with because why would you want to change the size of something? Well, in the case of a board game, uh, if you need better components, for example, it's very easy for you to search for things like a lump of coal or a of, a bale of hay or a World War II tank or a farm animal or whatever. You know, those things already exist in models, very likely already exist as models. Either they're actually scanned from something else or they're from another portion or another project. I mean, I need a piece of potato, whatever. You'll, you'll most likely find that thing. And what you only need to do is resize it to that board game size that you want. I have a fantastic example, which was, by the way, the time I broke. That, that thing made me think out of the box for every other project I ever had. Uh, my friend, who's really, again, into Terraforming Mars, when he wanted his ships... He didn't want to have a slot for the cubes or anything. And the person happened to be a big fan of Battlestar Galactica. So we figured, why don't we just put in Battlestar Galactica, you know, uh, ships, you know, let's put them some Battlestars. <clears throat> but I couldn't find any because every ship that I found was designed to be way bigger than it actually is. And um, what we ended up finding was the best looking model on top of that was like two and a half foot long. I don't know how those guys intended to print it. I don't really care. They probably were doing a breakdown and rebuild after. But when I found that, I realized all I needed to do was scale it down and I could get my way with it. And so this is probably the size that you see on your screen there. This is actually not even an inch. Uh, this is probably what the... Uh, the final size of it looked like. I took the exact same model, a two and a half foot long model, and printed down to an inch size. And it took me literally almost no effort. All I needed to do was say, uh, literally enter the measurement in the slicer software of how, how, why, how long I wanted it, 
And bingo, I got, I, I, I literally took something that wasn't meant for a board game, that was literally meant for an, a huge model for someone's room into a board game component just by changing the, the, the measurement of it. So when you can't find anything that you want for your board games, look for the things that you're looking for. If you want, for example, a mech suit for one of your games like Anachrony, right? There are plenty of mech suits out there. You don't have to look for Anachrony mech suits. Just look for mech suit, resize it to the shape that you shape and size you want. Bingo, next. Eclipse, you can have your own faction ships. War, you can make your own miniatures and so forth. So, um, that means if you want to have a crazy time with any board game that you have, you can literally retheme anything to anything that you want. So, if I wanted to make a France themed Catan, I could easily do that by downloading a French baguette for the roads, an Eiffel Tower for the thief, print a couple of Arc de Triomphe and a cathedral or two, and you know, there you go. Not very hard. So here's a quick exercise. How would you retheme Total Recall and with Terraforming Mars? It's doable. Very easy to do. Okay, so going beyond that, talking about parts that weren't meant for board games that you could make into board games, there are a lot of different alternative resources as well that exist to help you do that. Yes, you can go on Thingiverse and My Mini Factory and all that kind of stuff, but there are also places that have stuff that is left field again, such as Scan the World, which is a great profit, a nonprofit organization. Uh, it's at the very least, it's a project where people who have access to artifacts or items that have some historical value, they will scan them to the highest precision possible and share the, the 3D model of that scan with everybody else, which is very easy for you to download and use. So if you want super realistic looking old coins for your board games, you can do that by looking old coins on Scan the World. This is an actual coin. There's a whole history and story on how they found that coin and how many other coins of that um, uh, of of that demo of uh, that currency that they found, uh, you can print those and have them for your board games or your RPGs, right? Um, if you want creepy looking stuff, there's all kinds of fossils and and actual scans of important things such as this this uh, this prop that you can have for your RPG games as well. This is an actual Viking a skull that was found in a, in a grave. And if you want to have like a special looking tablet with some spells on them, you can have this old Babylonian, Babylonian tablet. You can print it. And by the way, print it as a joke for this one and specifically because it happens to simply be just a recipe for something. It's considered one of the oldest recipes ever found. But there are so many things, there are crazy things you can do. You can even turn that into a component for a game like Nation, if you wanted to. So, the solutions are out there, and actually there are a lot of them, and you may not even know that they exist, because sometimes people come up with some crazy solutions, and again, all board game related. So, my favorite example of, of, of nutty things that I found were the X-Wing storage solutions that I found out there. Now, in case you don't know, X-Wing is a miniatures game. <clears throat> and unfortunately, like most miniatures, there's no actual storage solution sold with these things. So what uh, people did for a little while were, um, you know, they would buy plano boxes and all kinds of bead storages and stuff like that. But then people with 3D modeling skills started building these specific storages for the ships, which were great. And I actually used some of them. But it tended it, it ended up not being enough. And what happened is over time, some people found out this really great hack. So there's a thing called the storage unit for Stanley. Uh, it's a, it's a tool company that makes these modular storage kits. Uh, and each component comes with three different sizes: big, medium, small. 
So someone modeled these these the, the sizes of these components that you can put in these storage units and basically created molds so you can have any ship from that game in them. And to make things crazier, Amazon made a knockoff of the Stanley organizer. And, and so it worked completely with that and it's literally half price. <clears throat> Long story short, look up these things, the, just search for the number on, on Thingiverse for here, here, and here to give you an idea of the, the types of storage solutions you can find for board games sometimes. You would be amazed of the possibilities that exist out there. And that needed some really good creative thinking. And you probably would not be able to just guess that that existed or that you would do a search for that. Sometimes you just need to know that it actually existed before you, you start looking for it, right? So that's just one of the many examples of things that you may not be aware of that exists for your games. Look thoroughly for your favorite games. You may be very surprised about what you'll be able to find. Um, so... I'm going to, we're near the end of the presentation. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a whole bunch of pro tips for things you can start doing right now, which you, by the way, the first thing you can do right now, look for the board games that you like on those websites, build up a list of things you want to start printing, or maybe be, get curious about printing. You can start doing right now. All right. But here are some pro tips of things you can start looking for if you know that you'll get into through printing after this presentation. If there's something that's in blue, you can get it right now because it's gonna save you some time. Everything else is just gonna be basically some help. So this is mostly tuned towards FDM printer enthusiasts. Um, it's not necessarily for resin printing, but again, it, no preferences here necessarily. I mean, no bias here. I'm Like I said, I'm gonna get myself a resin printer for the types of pro tips like this, go and look at the other sources I gave you. Uh, I know for a fact that he give them as well because I've, I've watched your videos about it uh, as I'm myself gearing up for a resin printer. So uh, when it comes to FDM printing, you can put another types of surface on top of the bed of the build plate, right? Uh, such as a mirror or glass plates. That gives off, that will create a very different finish to the part that's sticking to the, the, the bottom. Uh, it's actually will probably be more mirror-like and very shiny. So uh, a lot of people swear by this method. They basically just put a plate on top of their bill plate, a, a plate of metal or mirror. It's literally four bucks to, to get at a hardware store if you want. However, some companies sell brocosilicate, um, specialized tempered glass, which will last very long and won't warp with time, probably worth the investment as well. Um, prints often have this issue that they won't stick to the bed when you're printing with them. This is a technical issue that happens from time to time. A lot of people talk about bed adhesion being an issue. There are a lot of ways that you can get prints to stick more easily to your prints, to, to your beds. I use hairspray. It's almost never failed ever. Uh, and by the way, you want hairspray with big volume, all right? So I use Fructus Big Hair Volume. Still been using the same can for two years. It's not even close to being half, halfway done. Um, a blade scraper really helps, especially with parts that stuck too well to the bed plate, even after it cooled off. Uh, I use like literally a blade, a bladed scraper. And obviously be careful not to uh, damage the bill plate that you're using. Um, a spray bottle with a 50-50 mix of water and propyl alcohol. This is the same alcohol that people use to wash resin prints. That's the term I was looking for. Um, it really helps with cleaning build plates. And in certain cases, especially with mirror, with people who use mirrors, it tends to loosen prints from the glass for some reason, almost like water on ice. Uh, I mean, almost like salt on ice. It, you'll hear crack and all of a sudden you can remove it. Um, I said that you don't need to do anything that has to do with 3D modeling to enjoy 3D printing. But if you want to start somewhere, Tinkercad uh, is very easy to learn. It's literally building blocks. And 
knowing just a little bit of that can sometimes let you do things that you probably needed, such as inserts, right? Very easy to build with. Um, when I told you guys that slicers create files or instructions for your printers, that file is called a G-code. Over time, you will learn that G-code is very easy to hack. You can actually put in stuff in there like pauses, so you can change filament and change color, for example. You can create all kinds of things and all kinds of hackiness by like, toying around with, with the G-code itself. If you ever have some free time on your hand, look around for G-code hacks or G-code tips and tricks, and you will find a lot of interesting uh, ways to modify prints. I don't ever use them, but I know they exist and I'm happy to know that I know that it exists because it opens up a lot of possibilities, such as, but not limited to, implementing or embedding magnets in, print, in prints. Literally embed them and you'll never know they're there. Um, when you have a printer, you can actually print things to make it better. You can print its own upgrades, like a filament guide or better air ducts or, and so forth. It sounds weird, but once you have your, your printer up and running, you can make it better by printing things like cushions under the, uh, or, or springy like legs. So it, re it reduces vibration and stuff like that. There are a lot of things that you can do for your printer once you have it. And a lot of people joke around that they can't stop making improvements for their printers because they keep printing improvements for them or upgrades. So that's something you want to look into. And it's kind of weird at first because it's kind of self making itself. It's like eh, not even going to get in there. So um, bed leveling is one of the things that you keep having to adjust all the time, especially with FDM printers. This is one of the big downsides, one of the things you need to recalibrate all the time. Now, you don't need to do any of this. For the first year, I didn't care about these tips and tricks, and I kind of regret not doing it sooner because I managed to level my beds very quickly after I got to do it so many times, you know? But I, I realized that if you have stiffer springs under your bed levels, they're actually molded springs. I'll just Google it. You'll For your printer model, you'll most likely find people talking about that tip. Um, it's It becomes a lot easier and a lot more precise to level your bed. And if you don't ever want to level your bed anymore, you can also buy kits that make your printer aware of the level of your bed because an uneven bed basically makes your print wonky. Uh, but there are things that can automatically compensate for said wonkiness. Those are called automated bed leveling solutions or ABL. I have some on both of my printers now. I do not ever want to go back. But if I do, I'm not going to die because I know how to do it. But um, having ABL really cuts my my printing time uh, in half almost because I don't have to worry about, well, not in half, but my setup time is crazy fast now because I don't care about that part anymore. Um, now, this is a very common joke among 3D printer enthusiasts is that, like I said, sometimes prints take hours and hours, so you they print overnight. What you don't want to do is not be aware if your print failed or not while it's printing for two or three days. So if you can have a webcam pointing towards your print it will help you know that you're, you know, maybe you should go down back to the basement and stop that print if it's going completely haywire. Um, because that would just be a big waste of material. You don't want to waste that stuff, right? Uh, so if ever you have the ability to put a webcam to monitor your prints from afar, that, that could be a big help. Uh, and if you love 3D printing, and speaking of cameras my, while we're at it, um, if you have a... Uh, a Raspberry Pi, you can create something or actually print uh, something called, not print, sorry, you can you can set it up as a Raspberry, uh, as a, something called an Octoprint, which is literally a, a miniature print server for your 3D printers. I, since I've had them installed, I cannot look back 
it just makes everything faster and easier and I can access every single function of my printers through the web from any apparatus, even when I'm away at work. It is one of the best investments I've made and you don't need to do it. And I'm making you sound, and I'm probably sounding like you need to do it. I, I would be totally okay without it. But having it has made my printing life a lot more enjoyable because of all the things that I can do with it. If you are interested in it, look it up. But you have to buy a full Octo, uh, a full Raspberry Pi. And that may not be, that may be kind of out of the scope of what you want. If this, if you're already looking at all of this and you're you're doing it because of board gaming, so you're you're ready to jump into the game because of board gaming only. This is probably a little bit too too much right now. But later down the road, think about looking into this. It's a huge thing to help. It really makes printing more uh, accessible. But the most important thing that would ever help you when it comes to 3D printing, even resin printing, is the caliper. Now, the caliper is your best friend for a 3D printer. It, it is a way to measure things precisely, objects that are not regular size, way better than a ruler. And this is how you can tell the size that you want something to be printed to. So, for example, if I want to make... If I find a tile of something and I want to size it down to Catan, I could measure the tiles for Catan with that and tell you tell my printer exactly to which size I want it to blow it up or reduce it. It's great for printer calibration as well. Um, and it, there's a lot of different ways that you can use it, by the way. Uh, you can't see all of it here, but uh, I don't have mine here. Uh, but see, this is to the, pin, the, the pincer is here. That's to measure something as you would probably imagine, like I want to measure, for example, the width of this uh, bottle opener. But if I wanted to measure the inside of this thing here, for example, this this hole, I could use the, the pincers here, which are made to measure the insides of something. And at the very other end of this image, which you can't see, there's also a depth gauge, which is great to measure uh, the cavity of, of any... Uh, of any of your hole or and so forth. They're great for everything when it comes to 3D printing, especially board gaming. By the way, even cheap ones are good. Like 10, 12 bucks, they're not gonna be super precise, but gonna be precise enough. And that's what counts. If you want to design inserts, this is what you need anyway. Um, some of my favorite resources uh, that I found for 3D printing are here. These are the four main places I go all the time. The, my favorite of them all is Tomb of 3D Printed Horrors by Tom Tullis, uh, who also happens to uh, have all kinds of things that you can download and print. Um, if you want to, uh, uh, if you are into 3D printing minis and, and dungeons and so forth, and he's FDM based mostly. Uh, he has some great tutorials on how to print minis with FDMs. It goes in depth like crazy. Uh, and basically also has tips on how to paint stuff and so forth. Teaching Tech by Michael Laws is a bit different. This is definitely the geeky part of things. Any modification, big and small, that I've made is because of this guy. Because he gave me the confidence to jump in and do it. And uh, he has a lot of tips and tricks on how to help you calibrate your machine if it's not going well. Same thing for Tom Tullis, by the way, but uh, anyway. Um, Filament Friday, a.k.a. Chep, by Chuck Hellebuck. I, I never know how to tell, uh, tell his name. I think it's pronounced Hellebuck. Um, is, he's like the uncool uncle that has a 3D printer, and he has a lot of very good, solid advice on how to properly maintain your printers. And I just go there all the time as well, uh, whenever I can at least. And last but not least, there's Joel Telling who has this 3D printing show called 3D Printing Nerd, which is a great thing to have in the background when you're tinkering around with your printer. Lots of shows, lots of content, lots of interviews. Um, and basically all around interest in 3D printing. So he'll talk about every type of 3D printer, He's really big into filaments as well. Very interesting. 
Uh, other medias that you may want to look into if you're getting into 3D printing, um, 3D printing on Reddit, functional prints on Reddit, Fix My Print is uh, a sub I found not too long ago where people post prints that are not going well and people can give them tips and tricks on what they can potentially do if there's a problem. And last but not least, look up your printer's model on Reddit and see if there's not a, uh, a sub for it. Because if you ever need help, that's probably going to be one of the best places to look around. You can also find similar types of groups and help in, on Facebook and Discord. But also look by region, which is a great way to find other people that are like-minded that are probably able to help you out with uh, fixing or calibrating your printer. I know that during the whole COVID crisis, when everybody and their mom were printing stuff left and right to help out uh, first responders and healthcare workers, uh, it was by region that we were getting the most success in our efforts. The last but not least, the most important thing you can do for yourself if you want to start learning about 3D printing is to read the sacred text. Sacred text is made by Simplify 3D, by the way. Uh, it's a free link that they provide to everybody. You want to read this every day. It's like your Bible. Because they basically show you... I don't know if I can do that. Let me see uh, if I can't. Yes, here we go. Uh, so it basically shows you every type of misprint every way that your print can go wrong they will show you and have long articles on how to fix that so when i say read it every day i'm serious i mean do it do it do it now all right now board game time is over let me show you a couple of other things to help you really get into the groove of 3d printing this is very short but very sweet right so if you're still on the fence about getting a 3d printer for board games this is probably going to help you nail the coffin uh, put the last name on the coffin on whether or not you're going to get one because there are so many other things that you can do with a 3d printer obviously and these are some of the projects that in our house we we ended up doing or at least are still looking into it uh baker cube is one of my favorite things it's a one-stop shop to measure anything in the kitchen Every surface of this thing has the type of measuring apparatus that I need, be it a quarter spoon, a teaspoon, a half cup, a cup, whatever. It's great. I sometimes print it and give it away to people in the color of their kitchen because sometimes people like to color coordinate all their stuff. It's a great thing to have around. Um, my stepdaughter reads books all the time. I gave her one of those book helper reading things so she can basically read her books with just one hand and it really works if you want to make your own light fixtures you can with a 3d printer so if you have a board game room and you want to make it extra funky you can absolutely do that as well uh, if you're looking for a space in the kitchen you can make all kinds of pot, uh, pan pot holders so helpful i designed my own uh, this is not my design but i've designed my own custom headset holder uh, which is something that you can basically find easily anywhere on one of those websites if you never need something to hold similar apparatuses and gadgets and tools. And last but not least, um, you can even print stuff for outside. Even if it's in PLA, it's in the shade, you're going to be okay. Print some birdhouses or bird feeders and whatever. I mean, literally anything can be done. Now, here's a fun story about all the things you can do. Uh, a couple of years ago, there was this big retail chain that made a terrible mistake, terrible mistake, terrible typo on their website. And they basically were selling the Google Mini for not the right price. Let's put it that way. We ended up with upwards of 20-something Google Minis. And we had enough that we could start getting creative with our usage of them. Um, me and my friend basically gave a whole bunch away, and even after that, we were still not after Christmas, we're still flush in Google's, in Google Minis. So um, we started looking in ways that we could uh, use them easier or more easily. Or, you know, long story short, we did the same thing that we did for board games and applied it to Google Minis, 3D print and Google Minis. And we found this thing that I keep printing all the time because people always want some, which makes it possible for you to 
you know, basically plug the Google Mini and have it conveniently right next to the uh, wall socket instead of having it wired somewhere and being kind of, well, basically cable management is king in this case, right? So we started doing that and as, and then we found other things that we could do such as sconces where you can embed them in walls and ceilings and, and beds in certain cases. Um, we we basically started impl in, inputting them in in the house, literally. And finally, I found a really cool uh, um, housing unit for the Google Mini based on BB-8. So I started printing everything, except I didn't have orange, I only had blue. And we basically created this really awesome BB-8 that is more R2-D2 themed, you could say. And uh, he works fantastic to this day. So before I leave you guys, I just want to give you a couple of last tips and tricks. Um, 3D printing is very easy to implement in your lives if you, if, you, if you even look remotely for what you're doing and what you need in life. Uh, sorry, forget what I just said. I'm going to restart from scratch. Long story short, 3D printing is so common and it's so so commonly used right now that you can probably find files or, or models for almost everything and anything that you do in your life. Board gaming is a great medium to show you that example because board gaming is it's not necessarily niche, but it's not as popular as we I still wish it would be, right? So for example, look for these terms and see if you can't find something. For example, look around for your favorite hobby. If it's gardening, maybe, you'll find stuff for that. Um, what is your profession? Are you a teacher? Are you a handyman? Are you, what kind of, what, what job do you have? Are you a veterinarian? You'll find something for it, for sure. Look for things that you own around the house. You'd be surprised to know that there are things that you could probably print for it to make it more functional. Like we have a, something called a click and grow and we hated the fact that the it has so many little extra gadgets that were lying around all the time we ended up finding something that was literally tailor-made for it that held everything in place look up your car's mark and uh, mark and make and model my pontiac tour in 2006 had stuff who would have known look up for your favorite book your favorite movie, your favorite sports team. There is stuff out there for it, for sure. And you'll probably end up having custom made stuff that will make everybody around you like, where did you get that? You made it. It wasn't hard. So I will leave you on that note. Thank you very much for listening. I hope you guys had a great PAX and had a great uh, panel. Thank you very much. Stay safe. Wash your hands. Keep distance. Wear your masks. And have a very nice day. Thank you very much.